and followed him. This is the word of God. Thank you for that, Annie. Uh, while we get started this morning, I've got Kath has got a handout for you. We've done things a little differently. Uh, with the, the young people upstairs, we thought, let's, uh, let's do a bit more of a workshop. Rather than just listening to me, there'll be a couple of opportunities for you to interact with the people around you uh, as we explore what it means to, to make disciples. Uh, what it means to disciple our friends or our family members, our co-workers towards faith in Jesus. I wonder if you'd pray with me as we get underway. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your presence with us. For the gift of your spirit. God, we are grateful for the many ways that you have taught us and you have grown us that we might know you and love you and, and follow you throughout the whole of our lives. But God, we know that your mission is bigger than being disciples. You call us to make disciples. God, and we pray that you would show us this morning a little more of what that means, not in a theoretical sense where we uh, keep things in our minds, but in a truly practical sense where it starts to touch our hearts and, and shape our lives. God, that in all we do, we might not only honour you and reflect Jesus, but we would uh, share our faith with those around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we uh, begin talking about discipleship, Kath and Dwayne are just bringing around a little brochure. So you can fill in just some blind spots on the back, some blank spots on the back and, and follow along. Uh, but it struck home to me in a new way when I got home from church a couple of weeks ago. Uh, often I'm pretty late getting home from church. My girls tell me I talk too much. So finally after I made it home, uh, said hi to the family, made it to our eldest daughter's bedroom where she was sitting at the desk. And uh, in that moment she turned around from her desk and she asked me, can I, Dad, can I ask you a question? And her question's usually pretty straightforward. So, yep, no worries. You can ask me a question. And so I have to admit I wasn't very prepared when she asked me this question about heaven and hell. I don't know if you've ever been in those moments, but they've been exploring the question of heaven and hell in D-teams upstairs with the young people, and they must have done an excellent job. So she had some fantastic questions to ask. It was one of those moments where I took a deep breath and thought, I don't know that I have all the answers here. And we began a conversation. As we were talking, her sisters arrived in the room uh, and they joined in for maybe a minute or two in this conversation before the, the middle one decided, hey, can we watch TV, Dad? And that became her focus. The youngest one just said, this is boring. Can we do something more fun? Maybe I wasn't doing such a great job at explaining heaven and hell to all the different ages. But it struck me the challenge we often face when it comes to discipleship. The greatest calling and commission we have of Jesus, isn't it? To make disciples. To make disciples of all nations. To go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And, and yet I can't help but wonder, myself included, whether we have a, a bit of a blind spot when it comes to discipleship. Over the years, we've turned discipleship into something we do with Christians. When people come to faith and then we start to disciple them instead of something we do throughout the whole of our lives. And don't get me wrong, I know as a church we have a passion to see people come to Jesus. But if you look at the Great Commission where it says, go into the, all, all the world, it seems we've separated this call and this commission into two parts. The evangelism thing, the going into all the world, that happens over here. That's for those crazy few gifted people who are extroverts and are happy to talk to anyone, anywhere, at any time about Jesus. And for the rest of us, we invest in the church, teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. We do discipleship in the church where it's safe and where it's comfortable. And I have to admit, the more I've looked at this passage, I'm not sure that that's what Jesus had in mind when he called us to make disciples. 
When we look at Jesus, the, the master disciple maker, you can see very quickly that he was quick to go. And he was deeply committed to teaching his disciples to obey. And so discipleship was the whole journey. From people who don't know Jesus to people who are making disciples for themselves. And I think we need to understand this and, and wrestle this, with this more deeply in order to see the church continue to flourish in the generations to come. When it comes to making disciples, Jesus is the master disciple maker. Jesus is the one who began with these three, this motley bunch of 12 disciples who are uneducated, unschooled, and he takes them on a journey. And by the end of this journey, they are ready to go and change the world. They are the reason that we ourselves are sitting here because they choose to follow this commission and this command of Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to look at Jesus, to look at the way he lived and the words he spoke so we can do the work he has called us to. And more than a course that we run, Discipleship we see with Jesus is about these relationships that were built one day at a time. These relationships are built on truth and trust. These relationships where he modeled these simple, sustainable, transferable patterns that would shape not only the life of his disciples, but their mission as they went forward. And the Gospel of Mark, as was read for us this morning, is very much like a discipleship manual. It is this model and this example of how Jesus lived among his disciples. And the first thing I want us to notice in Mark chapter 1 is that God is already at work. God is already at work. I don't mean theological, we always sort of talk about God being at work. I mean he's at work in our world, in the real world, in your world and mine. So we see in the opening verses of Mark, we have this prophecy that's fulfilled in John the Baptist. God fulfills this prophecy through this crazy prophet preaching in the wilderness, living off honey and locusts. He's talking about Jesus when Jesus arrives down by the Jordan to get baptized. And more than the testimony of John, we have God who himself who speaks from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And as the spirit descends from heaven like a dove, it lands on Jesus. And then continues to lead him into the wilderness where he is tempted and tested and his character developed. Finally, he returns to Galilee. It says, in the power of the Spirit and begins proclaiming the gospel of God. Verse 15, it says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So what is the good news that Jesus proclaims? It's that God is already at work. The kingdom of God has come near. And now is the time when God's will will be done on earth as in heaven. And this call to repent and believe, to change the way we think and the way we act, is an invitation to respond to what God is doing. God is at work. He is already at work around us. And the challenge is learning to notice the signs. Struck me, uh, I was watching as I dropped Kayla off for the bus earlier this week. Uh, all the buses have these signs on them, don't they? These incredible signs. And the sign that was on this bus caught my attention such that I got in the car and Googled. It was this massive invitation, get on board with the Pigeon Project. Has anyone seen these buses around? No. Maybe you're just not noticing them. It had this sign, and I don't usually pay much attention to it. As I Googled, I was taken to this pigeon project. And you know what this pigeon project is about? Discipleship. Not in a Christian sense, but it's run by this online community run by the largest advertising firm in the world. Looking at what kind of advertising people are most readily engaging in. And so they've set up this group and basically they want people, ordinary people like you and me, to pay more attention to the signs around us. So we can log in and we can share what we've seen and we can respond. They want to do it to grow their business. 
They want to do it so they can tailor things to their audience. And the good news is you can win prizes if you do it. But in many senses, that's the first step of discipleship, noticing the signs, the signs that surround us every day, the signs of where God is already at work. And the prize is that we get to join him. When we can identify where God is already at work, we get to step in and be a part of what God is already doing in our world. The challenge, if you're anything like me and anything like we are with these buses, it is so easy to miss the signs. It is so easy to be busy and consumed with all of the pressures and the expectations of life that we don't stop looking for the signs of God at work around us. And so like Jesus, we need to pause and reflect. We need to be more observant so we can see what God is doing and we can respond. That is what Jesus says. Remember what he says to his disciples? I only see. I only do what I see my Father doing. That's what it means to follow Jesus. We are looking for where he is working. Instead of constantly trying to make things happen ourselves. Can you imagine if we started looking for the signs? Started noticing and and naming those places where God is already at work. Maybe in our home or in our workplace or along our street in our neighborhood. Getting ourselves ready to respond to God and partner with him. Now as I said, we're not going to just, I'm not just going to do all the talking this morning. So I want to encourage you where you are just to turn to a couple of people. And I want you to talk. There'll be the question will be on the screen. But I want you to to just have a quick chat about maybe where you see God at work already around you. Where are a couple of places you see God at work around you? And what are the signs? So it's a little bit dark, isn't it? And what are the signs you've noticed? How have you seen God at work? So turn around, have a chat to a couple of people. Thanks, David. That'd be great.
All right. I hope that's been helpful in recognizing God as at work, isn't he? God is at work around us. Sometimes we don't notice the signs, but God is at work. Maybe in, our, uh, in a school we're a part of, maybe in a, a, a workplace, maybe in a street or in our neighborhood. God is already at work. And he is at work in the lives of the people around us, not just the places. That's our second observation, finding people of peace. You know, when Jesus begins his mission, he sees, doesn't he, that God is up to something. And he responds by calling these simple fishermen to follow him. Verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting the neck in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. The Gospel of Mark, you often realize, reads like an action movie. It's always immediately, isn't it? He loves this word, immediately, immediately, immediately. The next thing happened. It all sounds like it's uh, very quick. But it's estimated between, uh, the, from the time between Jesus when baptized and his temptation uh, to when he begins his mission was about a year, up to a year. And so the question is, what has Jesus been doing in these 12 months between his baptism and beginning his ministry? What has been Jesus been up to? Seems he has been working as a carpenter, building the family business. He's been getting to know his neighbours, attending weddings or parties. He's been going about life as normal. And the two of the people he'd spent time with, hanging out, according to John's Gospel, are these brothers, Simon and Andrew. Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples. And the day after, Jesus is baptised in the Jordan. Uh, John makes this incredible announcement, this is the Lamb of God. And so Andrew and one of John's other disciples decide to check Jesus out. They go and they're following Jesus and despite this awkward introduction we read in the passage in John and their inability to string a question or a good sentence together, Jesus invites them, Andrew and his friend, to come out and hang out with him at home. And after spending a day with Jesus in John 1, we read the first thing Andrew did was find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, or the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus, and they become close enough over this time that Jesus gives uh, Simon the, this nickname. So that's mates in Australia, isn't it? Your mates when you give someone a nickname. And he gives him this nickname, Cephas, or, or Peter. As they have spent time together, in the house where Jesus was living, in the house of Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus realized there is this natural connection. They listen to him. They like him, sorry. There is this natural connection. They listen to him. They ask him questions and are engaged with what he's talking about. And they are willing to serve him. They open up, well, at least Simon Peter opens up the home of his mother-in-law um, for Jesus to come and spend time with them. All the signs when Jesus engages is that the Spirit is at work in their hearts. And that's why he heads for the beach along the foreshore. And that's why he calls Simon, and, and Simon Peter and Andrew to come and follow him. How do they respond? They already know Jesus. And so they drop everything and they go with him. In order to find these people of peace, people who like us, people who listen to us, people who serve us, Jesus pays attention to what God is doing in the lives of those around him. And the same challenge is true for us today. God is already at work in the lives of people around us. He wants to help us connect and get to know them, to discover these people of peace so we can journey alongside them towards Jesus. And I've been trying to pay more attention the last couple of years to who God has placed around me. What God is doing in the lives of those around me. And last year when Zoe started playing hockey, I connected with one of the dads. Uh, connected with a number of dads, but one of the dads I connected with a bit. We went out and we uh, had coffee. We shared, or not that I drink coffee, but we shared hiking stories. We, and we talked, we got into these conversations about some of the challenges that the church has faced in generations past. And some of the challenges he finds with the church. The girls uh, this year are at different ages in their hockey journey. But it's been this interesting thing. The past couple of weeks, it feels like every time I leave the church... Or every second time, I bump into him up the street. And we have another conversation. And I don't know if he is a person of peace. 
We certainly get along. We have great conversations. There's not so much opportunity to, to help each other in practical ways yet, but I'm looking to see what God is doing and maybe how I can join God. And this is the invitation for all of us, not just to notice where God is at work around us, but to join him, to find these people of peace who like us, who listen to us, who are willing to serve us, to see these people who God is already at work in their hearts and to come alongside. To come alongside and journey with them. And in the midst of all the chaos of life to point them towards Jesus they might discover him for themselves. I want to invite us to take a moment again and to turn to those around you and maybe just name whether there's one or two people who you think around you may be those people, people of peace, people who don't necessarily know Jesus, but people who where there is this deep and genuine connection. You like each other. There is this open and and meaningful conversations where you can listen. And they're eager to show hospitality, to invite you around, to go out for coffees. They're eager to serve you and bless you. So turn again to those people and see if you can name just a few, one or two. It's good. Uh, Hopefully you've been able to think maybe just one or 
two people in your life that you think, maybe God's put them there. And maybe God's doing something ahead of me. And maybe he wants me to engage. God is working the hearts of the people around us. And if we can identify who they are, we get to be a part of what God is doing. That's our third observation, that we can disciple our friends towards faith in Jesus. We can help them discover Jesus for themselves. I don't know about you, but discipleship, as I said, is often something we see as we do with Christians. When someone comes to faith in Jesus, we get them to, to, to come along to church or join a discipleship course so they can start to grow in faith and develop in character and engage with our mission, which is great. But Jesus didn't have any Christians to begin with, did he? Jesus didn't have any uh, Christians to work with. And so this discipleship journey began not with discipling those who were already come to faith, but discipling them to faith, helping them discover Jesus for themselves, helping them become disciple makers. And so discipleship is this journey from beginning to end, from people who don't know Jesus to people who are making disciples for themselves. So we see happening the rest of Mark chapter 1 as Jesus invites these simple fishermen to come and follow him. And then Jesus heads around uh, to the different synagogues, teaching and healing and casting out demons. He even sends them out, uh, prepares that, to prepare them to be a part of his mission. And somewhere along this journey, somewhere along this journey, as they get to know Jesus, as they start to learn from his words, to follow his rhythms and experience the miracles that he does throughout the Gospels, They come to this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. That he's come to restore the patterns and the priorities of God's kingdom. That they have a place and a purpose in his mission. So discipleship is about Jesus identifies where God is at work. He finds these 12 ordinary, uneducated people who listen to him, uh, are willing, uh, like him, listen to him, are willing to serve, and he invites them on a journey where they can start to discover who he is and what he's about for themselves. And on this journey, Jesus begins to model these simple, sustainable, transferable patterns. Uh, if you look in, uh, later in Mark verse, uh, verse 35, it says, very, in the mer- very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and they found him and exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And then Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he travelled throughout the region, preaching at the synagogues, teaching his disciples, until they reached this point of recognising who Jesus is. And what he has called them to do. So it means to disciple people to faith in Jesus. That we journey with them. Build relationships. That we love and serve them. So that more than a momentary conversion, this one-time decision... can see people discover Jesus for themselves. We'll see people choose to follow him, to learn these simple, transferable patterns so they can live as his disciples and so they can step into the full purpose of God. I want to invite you to to turn to those people around you and just talk about what is one thing you might do with one person of peace that you identified. One thing you might do to connect more deeply, to further that journey. Maybe it's to invite them out for coffee, your work colleague, you, you know, you usually cross paths over meetings and there's a connection, there's a relationship, you invite them out for coffee to have a, a deeper conversation. Maybe it's stopping for a, a lunch break and asking them to join you. Maybe it's going and having coffee with your, your neighbour across the road that you've started connect with. What is one thing you could do this week 
to connect with one of those people of peace who like you, who listen to you, who are willing and open to serving you. So take, take a moment and just turn and have a chat. All right. Now comes the hard bit. Now comes the hard bit. This is where it requires a step, doesn't it? Step of faith as we leave the church this morning and as we step back into our week. The invitation of Jesus is to take a step of faith. God is already at work around you. 
Maybe it's in your home or your street. Maybe it's in your workplace. Uh, Maybe it's in your friendship circle. God is already at work. And his invitation through the Great Commission is for us to be a part of what he is already doing. We've named some people who maybe for us are a people of peace. People who like us, there is this natural connection. People who listen to us, there is this generous and open conversation. People who serve us, there is this willingness to show hospitality and, and grace. God is at work in the lives of people around us and he invites us to lean in. To lean in and disciple people toward faith in Jesus. We don't make people Christians. We don't change people's hearts. That's all in God. But he invites us to be a part of this journey and come alongside these people to love them, to support them, to journey with them throughout all the experiences of life and to point them to Jesus. Trusting that he will work in ways that we might never imagine. This morning as we've been meeting, Hannah just came down before and and shared that six of the kids with their parents up there have put their faith in Jesus for the first time. (laughs) Pretty exciting. We want to see more and more. More and more people come to see the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. And for that to happen requires us to go and to make disciples. In a couple of weeks, on the 15th of October, we're going to have a workshop after church. So in the, the next few weeks, I encourage you to take that first step. Uh, organise that coffee, have that conversation, start connecting more deeply and journeying with that person that you've identified. We're going to have a, a workshop Uh, training in next steps around people of peace and and this discovery Bible method that you can use to journey with people and point them to Jesus. But I encourage us as we leave this place, church is not just about gathering. Church is about equipping and preparing us to live as followers of Jesus day after day in every place we go. And so as we go, I invite us and I encourage us to take a simple step of faith. To connect more deeply with that person of peace. See what God might do. And come back on the 15th and, and we'll journey into that a little deeper about some next steps that you might like to take. So how about I pray for us? And then Hannah, uh, we'll be led in our final song. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful Not only that you gather us to yourself, but you give us a place in your mission. That you call us to establish your kingdom on earth as in heaven. God, we ask that you would help us to be mindful of the many ways that you are at work around us. As we arise in the morning and set our feet on the floor, may we be willing to pray, God, show me the signs. God, lead me to people. God, use me to bless others and point them to Jesus. May we not only pray these words, but may God, you by your spirit, give us the confidence and the boldness to lean into the opportunities you give us so that many more might come to know and love and follow Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen.